Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the major part of our program this evening. First of all, let me tell you a little bit about the Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame. We always try to do this so that everybody knows what it does and how you can nominate people for induction into the Hall of Fame. The Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame was established to recognize, honor, and enshrine individuals whose leadership in or for aviation, whether by exceptional service or extraordinary achievement, has made an enduring contribution to aviation for Tennessee, our nation, and the world. Established in 2001 as Tennessee's official Aviation Hall of Fame by the 102nd General Assembly, those honored are recipients of Tennessee's highest honor in aviation or aerospace. This institution will record their achievements and perpetuate the memory of those enshrined here for all time. Eligibility for induction into the Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame is based entirely upon the nominee's significant and lasting contribution to aviation or aerospace for Tennessee, our nation, or the world. That service or achievement must have been made from Tennessee or if outside Tennessee by a Tennessean living or deceased. The Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame Board of Directors will select honorees once each year. Those chosen for induction will be enshrined at a formal ceremony held at the Tennessee Museum of Aviation. Nominations are perpetual until formally acted upon by the board. Nomination forms may be obtained from the Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame or through its website. Authentication of service and or accomplishment are the responsibility of the nominator and must accompany the nomination application. Nominations can be submitted at any time. There's one more dignitary I did not uh, introduce, uh, got skipped somehow. Senator Jim Tracy is here. Uh, if you'd give him a hand, Mr. Tracy is a real supporter of aviation, and we appreciate him very much. One more thing. We have at least one person from each uh, induction year here tonight, and I want to introduce them. From the first year that we inducted folks into the Aviation Hall of Fame, we have Evelyn Johnson. We've already noticed her. Please give her a big hand. From the 2003 class, we have Charlie Nelson. Give him a big hand. <laughs> From the 2004 class, Mr. John Ball. Yeah. From the 2005 class, Mr. Bob McNabb. From 2006, Mr. John Ellington. And from 2007, Mr. Bob Bomar. Now, are there any others here from those years that we did not see or take notice of? I think they were the only ones here. So, let us begin. I like to begin with this particular poem entitled, Because I Fly. Because I fly, I laugh more than other people. I look up and see more than they. I know how the clouds feel, what it's like to have the blue in my lap, to look down on birds, to feel freedom in a thing called the stick. Who but I can slice between God's billowed legs and feel them laugh and crash with his step. Who else has seen the unclimbed peaks, the rainbow secret, the real reason birds sing? Because I fly, I envy no person on earth. I want to take two minutes to say something personal. I want to say a word in memory of Milton Brown. Milton Brown passed away Monday of this week and was buried Wednesday of this week. Milton avidly practiced and promoted aviation. He bears the distinct honor 
of giving me my first airplane ride. He organized the first CAP squadron at Lewisburg, the Marshall County Composite Squadron, and he was the commander of that squadron for 25 years. He served on the Ellington Airport Advisory Board. I can't remember how many years, but he was chairman of it for about 15 years. He befriended me for some reason and encouraged my work as an FBO, and he fearlessly defended me as the airport manager, even in times of crisis and threat. He was always there, and he was always my friend. I would also mention John Womack, who worked for me for 28 years. He wasn't an employee, he was family. And he energetically pursued aviation. He told me on a number of occasions, well, I can make a lot more money somewhere else, but you know, when I get up in the morning, I just look forward to coming to the airport. I think it's proper and right that I should mention them tonight because they and thousands of others like them constitute the grassroots of aviation, the foundation on which we stand here tonight. And though their names may never be inscribed on a plaque and hung in a hallowed hall somewhere, they will always be enshrined in the hall of fame of our hearts. So, let's induct these people here tonight. Inductee number one is Mr. Joe Hawkins, and to present Mr. Hawkins is Brigadier General Robert V. Woods, who is the Director of the Office of Aeronautics for the State of Tennessee. Bob. Thank you, Clay. It's really an honor for me tonight to be able to induct Joe Hawkins because I have known and worked with him uh, for almost nine years now. I'm not going to read the bio. His bio is in your agenda. Please do read it. He's done many, many things. I do want to highlight just a couple. You may notice he served in the military, 101st up at Fort Campbell. What it doesn't say in there, though, is something that I think gives us our very first glimmer of what Joe Hawkins is to become. He went all the way from private to sergeant in less than 20 months, and that's pretty good. Particularly me, my experience in the military, I know what that really means, Joe. After he got out of the service, he started in 1979 by getting his AMP license, airframe and power plant, and started working for Stevens. You can read that in the bio. South Carolina someplace, and finally came up to Nashville, working for Stephen all those years. During that time, there are several notes from various people he worked with that said he was a great team player. And I think team player means a lot in this world. Nothing can be done without teams. He went through single-engine piston airplanes, all the way up through multi-engine business jets. Uh, the whole time he was at Stevens, he developed from scratch some cockpit procedure trainers, which in those days was something new. In 1991, he got his IA, his inspection authorization from the FAA, and that's when he came over to the state of Tennessee to be our chief aircraft maintenance technician, aircraft mechanic, if you will. He was our chief, started in 1991, and the entire time he was with us in the aeronautics division, there were no maintenance incidents whatsoever. He got MBAA safety awards every year. What I noticed during the time that, that I started there in about 2000 was that he always cared about his people. He was more than a team player. He was the team leader and would take care of all of them, whether they were the other mechanics, whether they were the other hangar technicians, the schedulers that were in the, that part of the division. Even the pilots he would help take care of, and that's kind of unusual in that world. Joe always said safety was first, but people were very, very close second, I'll tell you. He 
uh, I watched how he treated his people. I watched how he made exceptions to their schedules when required. I saw how they respected him, and I respected him for it. During that time, in the evenings, he got his BA degree. Starting in 2000, he started working on his master's degree. He got his master's of education in three years, again, just going at night. All the while maintaining safety of our state fleet of airplanes that fly the governor and all the department heads around. And then, like a rat leaving a sinking ship, MTSU hired him away from us. They stole him away just because he got his master's degree. But it's very pleasing now because he's really going to influence hundreds of aircraft maintenance technicians for the rest of his life. And I think that's extremely important. I just want to kind of sum up by reading the awards that he's gotten since I've known him, because I think this really says it all. 2001, the first year I was there, he got the Tennessee Department of Transportation Commissioner's Award of Excellence. That's unusual because we are a very small part of the big highway department, and for one of our Air Nice peoples to get an award was very unusual. The next year, the FAA, Nashville F, uh, FISDO, named him as the Aviation Safety Counselor of the Year. 2002, NBAA gave him a Maintenance Technician Safety Award. 2004, he got the FAA Aviation Maintenance Techn uh, Technician of the Year for the whole southern region of the FAA. 2005, the Tennessee Aviation Association named him the Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year. 2006, for the first time ever, State of Tennessee, as previously mentioned, he won the FAA National Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year. Gives me a great deal of pleasure. Joe, please come up. Educated, but an idiot nonetheless. <laughs> I just spilled my water. So now I'm going to choke. Thank you, General Woods, uh, for your gracious introduction. I'm honored more than I can express. Uh, the years I spent at the Aeronautics Division were absolutely some of the most satisfying of my career. Uh, thank you also, General, for your honorable service. And, and to our country, and for your leadership at the Aeronautics Division. So, if you please, please, please give uh, General Woods a, 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 a round. Distinguished guests, my fellow honorees, may I briefly introduce my cast of supporting, uh, uh, I want to say characters, but characters is not professionals. Um, first, my wonderful family, my wife, Tony. And, and my children, Kimberly and Brandon. Uh, my mother-in-law is here, uh, Jean, Mrs. Jean Lowry from Greenville, South Carolina. My mother-in-law always pushed me to be, be successful, and she always wondered, was I good enough for her daughter? I hope, maybe I'm a little bit there tonight. Thank you, thank you, Mama, thank you for coming. <laughs> my brother-in-law, Dale and his lovely wife, Tara, are also here from Greenville, South Carolina. Thank you again for coming and taking time out from, from your life and your family. Thank you for coming again and supporting me. From Middle Tennessee State University, my alma mater, my current employer, uh, uh, unfortunately, the executive vice president and provost, Dr. Jebert, is, is sick. Uh, there, there's a terrible virus going around the campus. Uh, and also, uh, Dr. Dean, uh, Dr. Cheatham and his wife could not come. Uh, and also, my chair, uh, uh, Dr. Wayne Dornan, is also sick with a, with a terrible virus. But if you would, please give them a round of applause. If for nothing else, <clears throat> if for nothing else, having the wisdom to hire me. Okay? 
Okay. Uh, I have a faculty. There are there are faculty members here today uh, tonight, and I, and I want to thank uh, Terry Doris for flying us over here and, and bringing them. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Jerry Hill is with us tonight. Uh, Gail Zotke and Daniel Prather and his lovely wife Grace are here. So thank you, my fellow faculty. Thank you for coming, and I applaud you for coming and supporting me. Thank you. And a, and a special. Uh, faculty member, our past chair, uh, Dr. Wally Maples. Many of you might know Dr. Maples. Thank you, Dr. Maples. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Dr. Maples was the one who's, who, who, who lit the spark, who came to the hangar at MTSU. We had a, we had a maintenance internship for many years, uh, and he came by and checked on the status of both the pilots and the maintenance interns. Dr. Maples is tired of me telling him this story. But he was the one that said, Joe, why don't you go back to school and why don't you get your degree? You, you would be good at it. So thank you, Dr. Maples. Without that encouragement, I wouldn't be here tonight. Thank you again. Um, our, fact, our aerospace uh, airport facilities manager, Mr. Barry Rodenkamp, is here tonight. Thank you, Barry, for coming. Uh, the rowdy group that you see over on the side here um, is, uh, is some, of my, some of my current students. And uh, I want to thank my current students for coming and supporting me. This will reflect on your grade. We'll work something out. Okay? Okay? Possibly, possibly you won't have to do the writing assignment or something like that. Okay? Our, the Murfreesboro Airport Manager, Chad Cherokee, is here tonight. Thank you, Chad, for coming all the way from Murfreesboro. And thank you for supporting, supporting me, Chad. Chad is also twice Airport Manager of the Year. Just once. I'm sorry. Well, it should be twice. I'm sorry, but at least once. Thank you, Chad, for coming. Okay. And of course, a, a, a couple other significant personalities. Um, a tireless and advocate and supporter of aviation maintenance technicians worldwide. She has a worldwide reputation. Uh, Ms. Jennifer Baker is here tonight. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for everything that you do for technicians. I'm sorry, I can't say thank you. There you are. Thank you, Jennifer, for everything that you do for our industry. And also, we have a, another honored guest here tonight in, in, in the, uh, at the consummate professional, the, uh, and it was mentioned earlier, Clay mentioned earlier, uh, AMT Society Executive Director Tom Hendershot. Uh, Mr. Hendershot is here tonight. Thank you, Tom, for coming all the way from Boulder, Colorado to be with us tonight. I'm sorry, Denver. I'm sorry. Wrong town. Right football team, but wrong town. <laughs> Tom is also one of the few individuals I know I honored the, uh, uh, tonight with the Wright Brothers uh, Award. Tom also is a, a holder of the Wright Brothers, but also the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award. One of the few individuals I know that own both a Master Pilot and Master Technician Award on the national level. So thank you, Tom, for what you do for our society. Also this week, on a, on a little bit of a sad note, our industry, the maintenance industry, lost an icon. Uh, Mr. Bill O'Brien uh, worked many years. He was an aircraft mechanic, and he went to work for the FAA. And I guess I could sum up his, his, his career in the FAA and his meaning to technicians in our industry was he was, his official title was National Resource Specialist. To me, that's pretty, that's, that's, that's pretty significant. Uh, Bill was a wonderful man, a tireless advocate of mechanics. He was one of the few, and I don't mean this as a slide to anyone, one of the few bureaucrats that when you called him, he answered the phone and said, hello, this is Bill O'Brien. It very seldom ever rolled over to voicemail, and, it, and you very seldom got a busy signal. Uh, he was a tireless advocate. Unfortunately, he's not with us. Uh, he was an idol to me, a mentor to me, and the industry will miss him greatly. He was a wonderful man. I wish you all had the opportunity to meet him, but he was a wonderful individual. Um, wow. What a wonderful, beautiful evening this is. I stand here before you humbled, very embarrassed, and very grateful aircraft maintenance technician and a collegiate educator. I am truly flattered and in awe. I am honored to be in this year's group of inductees, Phoebe Fairglave Omley, Mr. Reese Howe, General Womack. Wow. As I look, as I look behind me here, this wonderful group of aviation professionals, I am in awe. Thank you for including me. 
I know now that if I've ever allowed myself to take one day off, if I'd ever taken, I'm not sure I would be here tonight. This will come a shock to many of you that know me, for perhaps tonight, I'm almost speechless. Okay. But I am here tonight to tell you that, they tell me I'm here tonight because for nearly three decades, I maintained helicopters and airplanes the right way. And now I teach the next generation to do it the way it's supposed to be done. I don't know about that, but I know about this. I have too much respect for my fellow technicians and the passengers that fly on the aircraft I maintained. And I now have the wonderful opportunity to teach and show my students not to do it any other way. And if there is a single reason I am here tonight, I would like to believe that is the one word I stress to my students, responsibility. For as long as I can remember, I loved to work on and be around planes that went high and fast. But I wasn't interested in sitting in front. It has always been the technologies and the mechanical systems that held my attention. I'm an airplane mechanic. I've always been an airplane mechanic. For me, at this point in my career, it was a national evolution into teaching. And now I'd like to think that I'm a respected professor of aircraft technologies, inspired by the curiosity of my students. That's who I am. Everything that I am today, everything that I have today, everything that I've ever been is because of aviation. Not the drama and excitement and the Dell Devil tales that you see on TV or in the movies, but the airplanes and helicopters, like the ones we see on the runways and the hangars at our local airports. The ones that our family, friends, and business associates fly every day. I grew up listening to stories of my grandfather, a naval pilot from WW2. His anecdotes inspired me, listening, I'm sorry, inspired years and years of dreaming thinking, and finally, a career. In elementary school near Andrews Air Force Base, just outside Washington, D.C., I would get in trouble constantly from running to the classroom window every time I heard a plane fly overhead. Beginning in the third grade, I was permanently assigned to a classroom in the schoolhouse that had the fewest windows, or did not face towards the air base. In the fourth grade, my teacher blocked the only window that had a good view of the sky with a large poster board that read, airplanes will pass overhead. Will you? Okay. I read every airplane book that could, and the more pictures, the better. Almost daily, I sat in our treehouse in the backyard, and I dreamed of pretending to be World War War ace, Eddie Rickenbacker, or Gregory Peck as General Frank Savage in the World War II classic 12 o'clock high. I am a child of the space age, so I naturally followed the exports, the exploits of Scott Crossfield and the entire X-15 program. What is it really like to build and maintain an aircraft that goes to the edge of space? Like millions of others, I sat in front of a, a grainy black and white television watching Neil Armstrong take the first step on the moon. We all know hundreds of aviation heroes. We are so fortunate that many are enshrined here at the Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame. Aviation fit me because it's just naturally right. My career has always been about doing things right. If you inspected and maintained your airplanes the right way and looked after your coworkers, good things happen. That's what I loved about this industry. How a team effort involving long days and tiring nights always put a safe airplane back into service. If there is one word, perhaps it would be responsibility. A lot of people say this honor validates my career. But if I didn't, I didn't work for validation. I didn't work nights and weekends and holidays, missing time and events with my family because I saw a reward at the end. I worked hard and did it right the first way, the right way, the first time, because that's the way you're supposed to do it. Responsibility. Sure, I worked hard to get the most out of my God-given abilities, but that's what aircraft mechanics do every day. That's what every one of us here tonight does every day in our own special, own special jobs and careers. 
There are thousands of technicians like, like I who labor just as hard as I did. And you didn't, and if you didn't, you didn't stay on the hangar floor long. Responsibility. If this honor tonight validates anything about my career, is that rigging a fuel control or balancing a propeller outside in 10 degree weather with a 25 knot wind blowing snow up your skirt is more important than passing it off to someone else and staying inside the hangar where it's warm. If this honor validates my contributions, is that the guys who taught me the right way, the professionals like Bobby Sasser, Harry Edwards, Conrad Scott, Elvis Essery, who spent many nights and days with me on the road fixing things, they should be here tonight instead of me. Thank you, Paul Gay, Gary Ward, Arnold Stiles, Floyd Matthews, Maxi Crago, Tony Booker, Byron Stacy, Roland Cole. Each and every day they did what they were supposed to do, just as I do. No excuses or shortcuts, responsibility. I am indeed fortunate to have enjoyed a favorable relationship with the FAA. <laughs> thank you, thank you Pam Charles, Bruce Bolton, Paul Jones, Keith Stem, John Toy, Larry Williams, Wally Bevan, Robert Cope, and Bob Hill, who are here today with us tonight. I appreciate your oversight and your enduring support for the guys and girls in the trenches. Thank you to these men and women here on stage with me tonight and all members of the Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame. They are the greatest professionals in the history of aerospace who have welcomed me and treated me as an equal. It's going to take some getting used to, but I thank you for your kindness and respect. This is the second best thing that's happened to me. Thank you to the distinguished aerospace faculty and staff at Middle Tennessee State University. Professor Terry Doris, Steve Gossett, Daniel Prather, Gail Zotke, Bill Allen, Don Crowder, Nate Callender, Paul Craig, Andrea Georgia Lou, Ron Farrar, Wendy Beckham, and Jerry Hill. Thank you, Joyce Maynard. You are the most caring and helpful department secretary on all of MTSU campus. You have been my role models and mentors for many years. Thank you, Matt Taylor and Paul Mosey. I don't have the words to describe how you welcome me as a novice assistant professor in the nation's best collegiate program. You have been patient and supportive through my expansive learning curve. You know, Robert Frost wrote a lovely sonnet that described two paths how and where they diverged in the forest. And I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. I would propose that pretty well summarizes my technical and educational endeavors. My path led here to MTSU, and I'm honored beyond description to be considered as your peer. Thank you, Alan Jones, John Soper, Joe Kirkpatrick, John Lawrence, Tommy Hudson. We worked together for over a decade at the State Hangar, and we share many fun and embarrassing stories, none of which will be discussed here tonight. I will always cherish your friendships. To the great folks here at the hall, Bob Minter and Karen Minter, please give them another round. The board of directors, Mr. John Ball, and John Ellington, thank you for your continued encouragement and financial support of our youth who are trying to continue their education. Thank you, Dr. John McCurdy, for your love and, of, and care of the military and your labors to, to assist separating veterans in the industry. Thanks to everyone tonight for making this event a joy for my family. I will never forget. You're probably wondering what was the first when I said this honor was my second. My wife, Tony, is the best that's ever happened to me. For 26 years, she has been my best friend and the love of my life. 
she's my salvation and my guiding light. She's my past, my present, my future. She is the reason and the cause for everything that's good and wonderful in my life. I thank her for our wonderful children, Kimberly and Brandon. Thank you for the excitement and joy that you bring to our lives. And thank you for your smile every day I come home. I love you. And also I want to add, today is my wife's birthday. And she's spending it here with us. I love you. The feeling I had since I got this call is a feeling I suspect will never go away. I wish you all could feel what I feel standing here except for my knees that are shaking very, very bad. I hope other technicians in the future will know this feeling for the same reason. Acknowledgement and recognition for their behind the scenes contributions and responsibility for safety and airworthiness for the traveling public. When technicians do it right, the wonders of flight are enjoyed by all with little attention to the details. Now, I spilled my water, but I'm going to try to do this simple toast. To my fellow inductees, here's to us. For everyone else here tonight, here's to us and those like us. Salute. Thank you, Joe. Well, inductee number two is Reese Howell. Yeah, a lot of us have known Reese a long time. And to introduce Mr. Howell is the, well, what can I say? Mr. Mike Snyder, member of the Grand Ole Opry and one of the best banjo players in the world. <laughs> Thank you. Please sit down. <laughs> Uh, Y'all better be nice or I'm going to play this. All right. I'll hold it for you. Just set her down there. I'll hold it right yeah, it'll be fine. Well, I practiced all week long, more than a week, trying to get this thing down, read it good, and make old Reese sound big and famous over here. And <laughs> darn if Bob Hill didn't get up here and say everything I was going to say in about 30 seconds. <laughs> But I'm going to read a little bit of this because uh, if some of you folks out here don't know Reese, uh, he's a really a, a great guy and a legend in flying. And uh, he was born on a farm November 27th in 1936 in Lincoln County, Tennessee. After he took his first plane ride at the age of 10 years old in an air coop, which took off from a grass trip on the Yearwood Farm, just south of Fayetteville, Reese knew that he'd one day be a pilot. In the early 1950s, his uncle Melvin D. Lapp used to take him flying in his Stinson station wagon. And uh, <laughs> Reese, he graduated from the Lincoln County High School in 1955 while employed at the Borden Food Company. In 56, he became a teller to Lincoln County Bank. In 58, he soloed a tri-pacer after three hours and 40 minutes of instructions. He caught right on, didn't he? <laughs> well, while at the Lincoln County Bank, he got in good with the man that run the place and uh, talked him into a loan there, and he bought him half interest in a tater craft with Clyde Shelton. In 1961, he and Clyde Shelton, Wallace Cobb, and Bruce Tuttle started the Fayetteville Flying Service and it continued until 1970. And uh, then in 71, Reese attended the Mitsubishi Ground School flight training pro program after uh, being introduced to the Mitsubishi uh, with CFW uh, Construction Company. In 1975, 
the CFW Construction Company uh, got some helicopters and Reese learned how to fly them. He went to the Vault Helicopter Corporation Flight and Ground School. In 77, they, uh, CFW expanded their fleet there to a Lear jet and uh, Reese received training and typed in the Lear models 23, 24, 24B, and 25. Then in 1982, he started CFM, Corporate Flight Management, with his son, Alan. And uh, they started out with one aircraft and $1,000 capital. And then uh, a year later, David Augustine joined the company. And then Reese's oldest son, Charles Reese Howell IV, we better, uh, he's better known as Chuck, he, he came in and uh, into the corporation. Now, Alan is, he's now the CEO of F CFM, and uh, David Augustine is the president, and Chuck is the CEO of Great Lakes Airline in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And uh, so everybody in the family is, a, is a staying in the, in the flying business. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that uh, I'd like to say about Reese. That, that, uh, he's, he's got so many statistics here that he's, he's uh, trained more MU-2 pilots than anybody in the world and uh, he's uh, been a mentor to a lot of young folks that tried to follow in his footsteps and have moved on and, uh, and made, are making their living right now flying airplanes. He's, uh, Reese has got, like Bob said a while ago, around 34,000 hours of flying time and uh, 18,900 hours of that is flying the MU-2 and uh, 13,250 of those hours are hours that he spent teaching students. That's dual he's given. Reese is one of the most kind and big-hearted fellers I've ever been around. He taught me how to fly back in 1982. I met him in a hobby shop I used to fly radio control airplanes, and uh, I met him, him and Mel Brown in Danielle's hobby shop up at Nashville one day, and, and we got talking about airplanes, and Reese said that he flew and that he was a, he was a instructor. And I didn't know anything about Reese. I figured he just another fella that dabbled in aircraft. And I called him up. I said, Reese, I, you told me you was a teaching you taught how to, folks how to fly the airplane. I'd like to learn how to fly. So he said, well, boy, let me tell you what. You just come on up here, and we'll get you started. <laughs> so on March 28, 1992, I took my first airplane ride in a small airplane with Reese Howell. He rented the airplane. He wouldn't let me pay nothing for it. He bought me a log book and... I still got it. And he logged my flight, re-soloed me in my, uh, for my private, and he spent a lot of time with me. And he stood out on the runway the day I soloed with a camera, a video camera, to, to take my first flight by myself. And he put a camera in the airplane where he could... It hadn't, you could see me, you know, see the back of my head and, and my landings. And it was cold. I soloed on the 28th day of April. And he stood out there and froze. He's one of the most giving people I've ever been around. I've learned a lot from Reese to give. That's the biggest lesson I've learned from him. He's so kind and, and uh, he'll spend his money and your money's no good around him. And uh, we spent lots and lots of hours in airplanes. And uh, I sure do love this man. And I'm more than honored to be able to get up here and introduce him tonight into the Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame. Thank you folks for nominating Reese for this and, and putting him in here because there's not a finer feller in the world in my eyes that's brought as much joy to those in the airplane business as Reese Howell. He's a, 
not in the business for money. I could tell that right on the front end. I could see in Reese that he wanted everybody that enjoyed or thought they might enjoy our planes to get in it and let him show them how to do it right where they could really enjoy life up in the air. He asked me to play a banjo tune for him tonight. And uh, we looked for a mic stand and we couldn't find one. So I'm going to try to play this thing right up here on this podium. And Reese, I hope I hadn't wandered around up here too much and used too much of your time. Yeah, take that. I didn't read it anyway. I tried, <laughs> I tried to. <laughs> you know, I, I had a hard time in school. I learned how to play the banjo when I was 16 years old and I was in the fourth grade at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to make this sound good and I would like to say one thing there would have been more people here for Reese tonight there's a whole gob here for him anyway but there would have been more here but he didn't invite his ex-wives to come <laughs> well, Reese, I really do thank you, buddy. You know, I, I mean that. I ain't joking. Thank you for showing, for teaching me how to fly and, and giving me my... my uh, he, he gave me all three of my... Uh, uh, what's those check rides? That's what it is, ain't it? This is long since I had one. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> all right, well, I'm going to play you a song, Reese, and then you can get up here and, and tell them something good. I know it'll be good, you sweet feller. <laughs> Can y'all hear that all right? speak like I saw Mike was too. I'm going to try to remember to keep it kind of short for you. But uh, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for being here tonight. And yes, if I'd invited all my ex-wives, we'd had a few more here tonight. <laughs> and if everybody could have gotten here that the weather had been good, I had some more flying in. But uh, I can truly say that I'm really overwhelmed 
by the honor that, uh, that y'all bestowed upon me tonight. Aviation has always been a part of my life as far as I can remember. As a country boy, I used to pick cotton, lay on the sack, look at the clouds and think, boy, one day I want to be up there. And it's always been my life's ambition to be a pilot, and I can truly say I've been very, very fortunate, and I have been able to do what I wanted to do. So I live my dream every day, and somebody keeps asking, when are you going to retire? I'm like Miss Evelyn. Why retire from your hobby? If you love what you do, you don't have to worry about retiring. I'm so, somewhat like uh, our comedian George Burns, who found something that he could do, that he loved to do, and the good part about it, we get paid for doing it, and that's the great part about it. And yes, I'd like to thank Clyde Shelton out there. Clyde had an old tailor craft back in the early days, and he sold me half interest in it for 600 bucks. I went to my, I worked in the bank, and I had to go borrow money, so I had to go to the other bank to borrow money. We couldn't borrow it from our own bank. And my, the banker over there filled out the note, handed it to me, and said, what are you going to do with this $600? I said, I want to buy a half interest in an airplane. He snatched the note back and says, does your dad know you're buying an airplane? I said, no, sir. I'm 21 years old, and he doesn't have to know. He said, well, if I loan you the money, he'll have to know. But anyway, I got my uncle to sign the note for me, and my dad didn't have to go to that, so that's, that saved me in that deal. And then Clyde and Wallace Cobb and Bruce Tuttle and I started Fateful Flying Service, and uh, we had a lot of good times doing that, and, and we operated out of the Fayetteville Airport out there. And I'd like to thank y'all for doing all that. Chuck and Allen's great-grandmother, Boone, gave me some money to get my ATP check ride out of the way many years ago. And I also have another company, a CFW Construction Company and Mr. William R. Carter. While employed there, I got my commercial helicopter rating, my Lear-type rating, and most of all, I got my Mitsubishi experience flying with CFW Construction Company. And without this invaluable experience, corporate flight and Howell Enterprises wouldn't be in existing today and continue to prosper as we are. I'm also proud, proud to say that through Howell Enterprises, I've had the privilege of training over 2,238 MU2 pilots and hopefully that number will continue. And a lot of you are here tonight, and I really appreciate the efforts you've made. I've got a lot of you out there, too many to mention. But I thank you for your loyal and continued support. I'd like to thank my stepdaughter, Kelly Russ. She's made uh, Wings of Eagles one of the leading 141 schools in the state of Tennessee. And I'd also like to thank Franklin Graham with Samaritan's Purse. I've been very blessed there because I have been to a lot of countries and a lot of places that this country boy would have never seen if it hadn't been for Franklin and through training his pilots and flying with Franklin. I've been to places like Providina, Russia, and I don't know why anybody would want to go to Providina, Russia. It's the coldest place I've ever been. But the neat thing was we would depart Nome, Alaska, crossing the Barren Strait, the frozen sea, cross the Dateline, and we would depart on Tuesday, arrive in Providina on Wednesday, and then fly back, and we're back on Tuesday. And all of that within less than two hours round trip flying. So that kind of made things really interesting. I was in Amman, Jordan. I've been in Ethiopia, in Athens, Greece, where I got to go to the Parthenon and stand on Mars Hill. Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Roman, Rome, Italy, and Cairo, Egypt, where I got to ride a camel and even go down into the pyramids, which was really exciting. And then I went uh, to Nairobi, Africa. That's where I was training a lot of the missionary pilots there, but where I got to meet my family, uh, Caleb, Sarah, and his children. Excuse me. And I'm glad to have Caleb, Sarah, and their six children here tonight with me from Nairobi. My son, Alan, and David has given them the opportunity to have it. Thank you. When I first went to Nairobi, I met Caleb and two other gentlemen over there, and, and I asked, uh, when we started back, I was going to bring one of the African guys back to get his ATP check ride back in the States. And I said, uh, Caleb, what would y'all like to have when I, when I send uh, the pilot back from over there? 
And you know, the surprising thing was, I thought they would, I honestly thought they'd say tennis shoes, blue jeans, and you know what they wanted? All three of them, tools. They said, give us tools and it'll give us a chance to make a living. Later on, I sponsored Caleb and the th two other mechanics to come to the States and go to Miss Baker's school up there in Nashville and get their A&P license. They went back and got a better paying job. Caleb went back and got on with KLM Airlines. And thank goodness for that, one of the flights over there, I was coming back real tired, and Caleb went up to the little lady there in the middle of the night and said, got a seat up front from Mr. Howell, and he got me moved up to where at least I could sit without being squashed in the seat. And that was really a great pleasure to have that do it. Uh, it's, it's not, it, it, I, excuse me just a minute. <clears throat> I guess I better thank Mr. Mike Snyder too, because if I don't, I'm sure he's gonna send me a bill for that good banjo playing back there. You know, he, he gets paid pretty high to come up and do that, and so I don't, I don't wanna end up having to pay for that. And I'm a blessed, very blessed man to have such a wonderful family. Without their love, support, and understanding, I would not be standing here in front of you tonight. My parents, C.R. and Emily Howell, instilled in me strong worth ethics and the wisdom to never lose sight of your dreams. And I cannot thank my family enough for all the sacrifices, big and small, that each and every one of you have made from time to time, and I love you all. All of my colleagues, students, peers, and dear close personal friends, you have each been an inspiration to me and the, to be the best that I can possibly be. You are all my inspiration. Finally, as the old say, last but not least, I'd like to thank David Augustine, my son, Alan, corporate flight management, and the, and the good pilots that stood in and helped get everybody over here tonight. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I'll forever be thankful to you for all you've done for me. Thank you. Mr. Reese Howell, he knows what he's doing. I've been through his Mitsubishi school. And he, that was a long time ago. Well, inductee number three is Phoebe Fairgrave Omley. Tonight to present her is Dr. Jan Ann Sherman, professor and chair of the history department at the University of Memphis. And she is currently writing a biography of Miss Omley. So, Dr. Sherman, if you'd come forward and make your presentation. Right behind you. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Looking at the wrong place. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is such an honor to come tell you about Phoebe Omley. And it's humbling, too. And it's frustrating, as well, because it's very difficult to sum up a life in 20 minutes, especially one as full and as colorful as Phoebe Fairgrave Omley. The best I can do is just give you a few highlights. Phoebe Omley was a true pioneer in the field of aviation. She began her career at the age of 18 in 1920. Note how young she looks there. In those post-war years, there were very few opportunities for men in aviation and fewer still for women. So Phoebe did the only thing she thought she could do she learned to walk on wings, hang by her teeth below the plane, dance the Charleston on the top wing, and parachute. She contacted with the Fox Moving Picture Company to sell stunts to the movies. She bought a war surplus Jenny, and she hired a war veteran, Vernon Omley, to fly for her. After a couple of months of intensive practice, the Phoebe Fairgrave Flying Circus was born. The best that I can find out, it was the second one, the second flying circus owned by a woman. Once she was airborne, Phoebe would climb out onto the wing, make her way to a vertical strut, then climb to the top of the upper wing. She told the press that wing walking wasn't much more difficult than climbing up on a table. Quote, you shinny up the strut, grab hold of something on the top wing, throw your knee up there, and climb up. 
Once she was on top with the wind whipping her clothes, she'd hook a toe beneath a guy wire, spread her arms wide and ride, and sometimes dance, while Vernon put the plane through a couple of loops, a few touch and goes. She hung from the tail skid with one hand. She did handstands and headstands on the top wing. And she had a special leather mouthpiece attached to the end of a rope tied to the landing strut, which she gripped between her teeth as she dangled and twirled in the plane's slipstream. But Phoebe was particularly keen on parachute jumping. Once she found out about parachutes, she was hooked. Now in those days, parachute jumping was considered an avocation for lunatics. Chutes were very bulky. They were packed in large duffel bags that were affixed to the landing brace. Those wishing to use one then had to climb out of the plane, crawl beneath the fuselage, hang by one hand on the landing gear to fasten the chute to the harness, jump free of the plane, and hope the pull of your falling body will open the chute. Most of the time it did. I hope the pictures are showing as we go. Um, this should be a picture of her just before her first jump in April 1921. That's her brother Paul in the plane. In Phoebe's first jump, she landed in a tree. She slid through the branches until her chute caught on the treetop. Dangling several feet off the ground, she unsnapped her harness and dropped to the ground. She later told the press, I find no trouble in climbing anywhere on a moving plane, but I was just a little scared when I began to sail through the air, and I almost lost my nerve before I made the jump. But after this, I'm sure I'll like it. On her second jump, she landed in a small lake. Luckily, the wind caught the chute and dragged her to shore rather than dragging her under. But it made her real nervous. On her third jump, just six, six months after her first plane ride and barely two months after her first jump, Phoebe decided to go for the world's record parachute jump for women. That's Vernon beside her in the photograph. She wrapped an inflated inner tube around her body in case she'd land in water. She wasn't going to have that happen again. Their specially rigged high-performance Curtis Oreo took over an hour to climb to the target altitude of 15,000 feet. The temperature dropped rapidly. Frost formed on her goggles, and the motor started to mist from the cold. Struggling for breath, she climbed out of the plane, made her way to the parachute, and with numb fingers clipped on her harness and jumped. The big chute didn't open properly in the thin air, and she was in free fall for the first few thousand feet. When it finally opened, it pitched and swung violently, making her sick. She'd handily broken the record, but she told the press, it was terrible. I never want to try that again. She had many close calls and some very serious accidents. One time, for example, she drifted into some high voltage lines. She struck them hard enough to bounce away, but not before 2,300 volts went through her body. Some 3,000 people watched as the current knocked her unconscious and she fell to the ground. She regained her consciousness later in the hospital where she was treated for severe burns. The hot wires had seared her flesh to the bone in half a dozen places. The current had blown out the bottom of her foot. But what she worried about most was that her mother would find out she was hurt. So she immediately went back up. There were very few things Phoebe was unwilling to try. Vernon and Phoebe spent two summers, 1921 and 1922, doing exhibitions and air shows at county fairs and farm exhibitions throughout the Midwest. For a time, they teamed up with stunt flyer Glenn Messer so they could do even more complicated stunts. Their showstopper, though, was Phoebe's own invention, a double parachute leap. It started like a standard jump, but once she was free of the plane and apparently headed for a safe landing, she'd cut loose from the canopy and free fall. With the crowd holding its breath, thinking her chute had failed, Phoebe would wait until the very last moment, then pull the cord on the small drag chute just in time to slow her descent and prevent certain death. Thousands would come out to see Phoebe's show, but it was difficult to ensure that all of them paid to see it. It was a tough way to make a buck, and sometimes the Phoebe Fairgrave Flying Circus would make less than $10 profit a week. Phoebe and Vernon landed in Memphis at the end of their circuit in 1921, performing at the Mid-South Fair. 
They returned again in 1922, this time as a married couple. Vernon was eager to settle down and make a living with aviation. He didn't like the daredevil stunting. The Omley set up operations first in the middle of the horse track at the Memphis Driving Park and began offering rides and lessons and putting on shows for the locals. They were part of a group of flying enthusiasts, mostly veterans like Vernon, and together they formed the Memphis Aero Club and eventually built Memphis's first real airport, Armstrong Field, in North Shelby County. Omley's company, Mid-South Airways, was the fixed-based operator, and when the new Memphis Municipal Airport was established in 1929, he moved his operation there. Vernon was happy to settle down. He established one of the first flying schools and taught hundreds to fly, including the author William Faulkner and his brother Dean, with whom he formed a flying circus for a brief time. Phoebe, meanwhile, concentrated on learning to fly herself. In 1927, she became the first woman to receive a transport pilot's license from the U.S. Department of Commerce, which had taken over the responsibility for licensing commercial pilots. And she was the first woman to obtain an airplane mechanics license as well. In 1928, Phoebe became a consultant and a distributor for the Mono Aircraft Company of Moline, Illinois. They built tiny, fast, single-wing monocoupe racers, 30-foot wingspan, 55 horsepower. They provided the planes, and she provided the publicity. In 1928, she was the only woman competitor in the Ford National Reliability Air Tour for the Edsel Ford Trophy. The 6,304-mile tour started in Dearborn with 24 planes and went west to California, Oregon, and Washington. And it made a great circle to the east across the southern United States. The 30-day tour stopped in 32 cities, 13 states, and traveled over regions rough enough to test the stability of any plane and the skill of any pilot. In her tiny scarlet and black monocoupe, Phoebe traveled alone, taking neither navigator nor mechanic. She told reporters, if I take a mechanic, they'll say that he flew the ship through the bad spots. No, I'll be my own mechanic, and I'll fly the plane myself. She ground looped and flipped the monocoupe in Texas, but she finished the race in 24th place with only a few minor injuries. At the end of the race, she was hoisted onto the shoulders of Edsel Ford and Governor Green of Michigan. America staged its first National Women's Air Derby in 1929. This race began in Santa Monica, California on August 18th and ended in Cleveland eight days later. Twenty women entered the derby. Each pilot was required to fly alone to carry enough water and a three-day supply of food. Much of the terrain over which the pilots flew was hazardous, deserts, mountains. They navigated by dead reckoning, aided only by temperamental compasses and road maps. The Women's Air Derby was serious business, but Will Rogers' name for it, the Powder Puff Derby, was picked up by the press and it stuck. Phoebe Omley was perhaps the best prepared of the women pilots for the rigors of the race because of her experience in the Ford Air Tour. She knew exactly what she and her plane were capable of. As a result, although a number of women had serious problems, including fires and various crack-ups, and actually one death during the race, Phoebe had a relatively uneventful journey. She led every leg in the CW class, that was with a total piston displacement of less than 510 cubic inches, and she won the race for that CW class. Louise Thadden landed first in Cleveland. She had the fastest plane, and since this was a speed race, she was declared the winner of the overall race. Amelia Earhart was third. Phoebe had arrived fifth. But she won the big trophy, the efficiency trophy. That's the big one in the middle. I, keep, I have to look, make sure you've got my slides up there. <laughs> the big one in the middle was um, sponsored by the Pneumatic Tool Company of Cleveland and it was using a mathematical formula to handicap the race and determine the winner, and she won it hands down. She's on a roll. This next photo was taken a year later when she arrived in Washington to invite President Hoover to the air races in Chicago. It is 
in fact, the only photograph of her in the Library of Congress. Phoebe crossed the finish line first in the Dixie Derby of 1930 in a 1,575 mile race through the South and the only race open to women during 1930 air races. She took the purse of $2,000. She also took first place in two speed events, five laps of five miles each, with a top speed of 139.97 miles an hour. But the big win for her was in 1931. She was the overall winner in the 1931 Transcontinental Handicap Air Race, another race from Santa Monica to Cleveland, where she bested some 55 other entrants, including 36 men. It was the first time in the national air races that men and women competed against each other. They raced over the same course, but were judged separately and awarded separate, but equal, prize money. But it was the sweepstakes prize of $3,000, which translates to about $35,000 in today's money, the Errol Trophy, and a brand new Cord automobile that was awarded to the pilot, regardless of sex, who had the most points overall. Phoebe Omley took it. They wrapped a big horseshoe of roses around her and took her picture. Phoebe's exploits had made her famous. In 1932, she got a telegram from Eleanor Roosevelt. She asked Phoebe to fly around the United States campaigning for FDR. She covered over 20,000 miles, stumped in 16 different states, and spoke to countless potential voters. The Roosevelt camp and its success was very grateful. After the inauguration, Phoebe received an appropriate appointment. She was named Special Advisor for Air Intelligence to the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. The NACA was the predecessor of today's National Space and Aeronautics Administration. Phoebe was the first woman in the federal government to hold an official post in connection with aviation. From her desk in Washington, she used her influence to give other women aviators a chance to prove themselves as capable as men. Just one example was her air marking program. She conceived this idea and initiated it in 1935. These are the days when pilots navigated by inching their way down a map with their thumb, following a highway or a river, or by buzzing the local depot to verify their location. This program called for 12-foot black and orange letters to be painted on the roofs of barns and factories, warehouses, water tanks, at 15 square mile intervals to identify the locale, the distance, and the direction to the nearest airport. It was part of the Works Progress Administration, so it provided thousands of jobs for unemployed men. But it also allowed several women pilots to find a place in aviation administration. Phoebe hired a staff of female flying administrators to travel to WPA centers and establish the program in every state. The program was an unqualified success. Within a year, they had it 58% completed. Phoebe received well-deserved credit with both, for both an innovative idea and an effective execution. She was featured in Time and Newsweek magazines. In 1935, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt honored Phoebe Omley as one of the 10 Outstanding Women of the Year. Unfortunately, though, personal tragedy overshadowed the joy surrounding Phoebe's achievements. On August 5, 1936, Vernon Omley and seven others aboard the city of Memphis, a three-month-old Lockheed Electra commercial airliner, died when it crashed while trying to land in fog in St. Louis. The plane cartwheeled and blew apart. This was such a tragic irony for a man who almost always flew himself and had such a passion for safety. He was only 40 years old. A devastated Phoebe resigned her post from the NACA and came home to Memphis to bury her husband. She didn't return to Washington again for several years, but the years she spent in Tennessee during the late 30s were very productive ones. In 1937, Phoebe and W. Percy McDonald authored the state's new Aviation Act, calling for a seven cent a gallon aviation fuel tax. The money from that tax was split in half, one half dedicated to maintenance and improvements at state airports, the other half financed aviation education for Tennessee's youth. Phoebe helped establish a system of state-supported schools for training civilian pilots that became a model for the National Civilian Pilot Training Program, a federal project that ultimately trained 10,000 pilots in 460 colleges and universities. 
1941, Phoebe returned to Washington as a senior private flying specialist of the Civil Aeronautics Authority to coordinate aviation activities for the WPA, the National Defense Commission, and the Department of Education. During the first months of that year, she traveled over 12,000 miles, establishing 66 schools in 46 states under the Civilian Pilot Training Program. One of these, in Tuskegee, Alabama, was the only school that trained black pilots. Phoebe returned to Tennessee in 1942, again to try her luck at establishing a program that the federal government would take up. This was intended to alleviate the potential shortage of, of um, instructors, pilot instructors for the military. So this school that she established was to train women as primary flight instructors for the Army Air Forces and for the Navy. Again, this was intended as a model for a national program. She started out with 10 very highly motivated young female pilots in a converted house on the edge of Gillespie Field in Nashville. The training was tough, and Phoebe expected a lot. She kept it deliberately spartan and resisted the press's attempts to talk about her women as glamour girls. The school graduated these 10 women with 62 hours of supervised flying, 216 hours of ground school instruction, 162 hours of flight instructor ground school, and at Phoebe's insistence, 162 hours of mechanics training. These women ultimately trained more than 500 men, but a federal program never materialized. While the government was interested, the military was not. They did not wish to use women to train men pilots. After the war, Phoebe worked on research in Washington on safety issues, flight training methods, a host of other projects under the auspices of the Civil Aeronautics Administration. But the nature of the organization begins to change dramatically after the war as President Truman appointed more non-aviation people to the hierarchy, and Phoebe was not pleased. She abruptly resigned in 1952, claiming the government was regimenting and regulating aviation out of business and she would remain out of aviation the rest of her life. She returned to the Mid-South. She bought a cattle farm in Como, Mississippi, something she and Vernon had planned for retirement. Five years later, she trained it, traded it for a hotel and a cafe in Lambert, Mississippi, but a tornado wrecked her property. The lady daredevil who had attained the heights now fell to the depths. She was broke. She had lost everything. Over the next dozen years, she lived in more than a dozen different places, in Alabama, Florida, Virginia, Ohio, Illinois, sometimes staying with old friends, sometimes working as a companion for elderly ladies. In 1970, she landed in Indianapolis, where she lived in a transient hotel for five years, a victim of poverty, lung cancer, and old age, too proud to let anyone see her in what she described in letters as her deteriorated condition. She died on July 17, 1975, at the age of 73. The Memphis chapter of the 99s, the women's organization she helped found in 1929, brought her back for burial next to her husband. Then in June 1982, 60 years after Phoebe and Vernon landed in Memphis and brought the city into the air age, the control tower at Memphis International Airport was named the Omni Tower by an act of Congress. Yet in one more tragic occurrence, the plaque never arrived, the ceremony was never held. Now with a new control tower under construction, I'm hoping, very, very strongly hoping to get that oversight rectified. So to sum up, Phoebe Fairgrave Omni was a woman of daring, of great courage, somebody who was devoted to aviation and did so much to advance that industry. Her extraordinary accomplishments have earned her a distinguished place in aviation history, and I thank you all for honoring her today. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm going to trust this with you, I think. Okay. That's a great honor. Just Thank you me. so much. Oh, it is so humbling and such an honor. Thank you. And if you wouldn't have to sit in the chair. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Inductee number four is Major General Fred Womack. And his presenters are Charles E. Nelson, who is founder of the Swift Museum Foundation, and Captain Gene F. Sharp, who is, v who is VP of Operations of the U.S. Air Retired. If you gentlemen will come forth. Thank you. Needless to say, I'm very honored and pleased to have a small part in the induction of my longtime very good friend. Been friends longer than either he or I, either one, went on up to. As has been previously suggested, I'll not read his bio, but I know you have by now, and you've already noticed that Fred has worn many hats. Oddly enough, each of the hats that he's worn in connection with aviation is worthy of recognition in the Aviation Hall of Fame. We're talking about general aviation, warbirds, National Guard, and certainly, certainly the airlines. He's come a long way since driving a school bus and going to high school and mail boy in the National Guard. His school bus grew up to have wings and as most of you know, he later become commander of the National Guard. Fred has allowed me several great experiences during the years. One of the first ones I remember is doing wheel landings in the snow with him in his J3 Cub. He commented to me, Charlie, you can put that in your logbook, and I'm sorry I never did. Another very special occasion for me was coming down final at Randolph Air Force Base in my T-35 Buckaroo to attend his U.S. Air Force retirement. That was special to me because I was bringing that airplane down final to Randolph 50 years after it was based there. And I never would have had that opportunity without Fred. The man who likely knows more about Fred's National Guard activity and airlines experience is Captain Gene Sharp. As mentioned, has already been mentioned, Captain Sharp is retired as Vice President of Flight Operations for U.S. Air. I first met Gene when Fred invited me to come up to Seattle, Washington for a ferry flight of a brand new 737 back down to Winston-Salem. Now, to you guys that fly around for the airlines, that wasn't any big deal. But for an old country boy out of East Tennessee, that was special to me. And I really appreciated it. But when you accomplish as much as Fred has through the years, the man's got to have some skeletons in his closet. And I've looked for them, and I can't find them. But if anybody knows, I think Gene Sharp does. So with that, I invite Gene to come and share his knowledge and his experience with you. Gene? Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. <clears throat> You're right. I know where the skeletons are. Uh, yeah, just be patient. We'll get to you. Uh, I tell you, I'm really delighted to be here. Two reasons tonight. One is to talk about Fred, and the second one is I got to visit for a long time with an amazing instructor that got me started in aviation. Hey, Evelyn just had her 99th birthday. Uh, but three days after her 45th birthday, she soloed me in a J3 Cub. So we go a long way back there, and it's just great to see her again. Well, Fred, let me, uh, let me say a few things about you. Uh, Fred and I go a long way back. Uh, back to the uh, early 60s, we were having uh, lunch in the, at the Guard. We were both in the Guard, both of us enlisted types. Uh, we were having lunch one day, and Fred uh, mentioned the fact that he had heard that I was an instructor and he wanted to learn to fly. And I said, well, that's fine. We can do that. Uh, a few problems came up with trying to schedule all that. Fred was driving the school bus, and I had just taken a job, a corporate job, and uh, that lasted for about six months. And then I went to work for the airline, and uh, now we're into the um, uh, mid-summer of 1961, found out that we were going to be activated and sent to Germany. So that's where we spent the next year. 
And while we were in Germany, though, we found that they had an aero club up at Sumbach Air Base. So we decided, well, hey, that's a good place to learn to fly. They had a J3 Cub and a uh, Cessna 140 up there. So we said, we'll just join that club and we'll go do that. And the very first day, I have to tell this story, the very first time we taxied out for takeoff, we're sitting there on the taxiway. Of course, we get a light signal from the tower. Uh, but we're sitting there on the taxiway, and this uh, C-130 or KC-135, I can't remember which one it was, but anyway, it's a big four-engine thing, and it's making all kinds of noise during the takeoff roll. Well, on either side of the runway, there's a herd of sheep grazing. And those sheep, while that four-engine airplane was taking off, they didn't miss a nibble. They just kept right on eating, they didn't move. We get the light signal from the tower, and we, ta we taxied out. And as soon as we applied takeoff power to that 65 horsepower cub, the sheep all ran. Both sides of the runway took off. So we didn't know whether that was good or bad. But we later come to find, uh, or our thoughts were, that that was just the sheep making way for a new career that was in the beginning. Um, well, we now get back home. Uh, Fred and I are still in the guard, and we both get commissions about the same time. Fred leaves to go to a maintenance school and then comes back to pilot training. And I've been at Piedmont all this time that was going on. So uh, Fred in 1967 actually comes to the airline, and we get him started. Um, that went on for a good while. He got a captain's bid a little bit later on. And I left and went to Winston-Salem in a management development program. And, uh, then I was put in as a director of flight operations, and uh, uh, Fred uh, moved up as, a, as an assistant to me at that time. The Deregulation Act of 1978 really afforded the airlines such an opportunity. It's just unbelievable. It'll never happen again. And it happened just wonderful for, uh, for Piedmont because we had everything in place. We had the airplanes that were ready to be bought, and uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, Fred was uh, designated, uh, as I moved up, there were some retirements, and I was the VP of Flight Operations, and Fred moved up as the uh, Director of Operations, and then we later uh, added uh, the flying safety position to his, because that was something that was a real concern of ours. Uh, safety was just so important. You have to get up in the morning thinking about it, and you have to go to bed at night thinking about it. Piedmont did a lot of things that were first. Uh, we had the first digital communication system. Uh, we had the first airplanes that were equipped with wind shear devices. We also had uh, had systems that um, uh, that were ground proximity warning systems. The first fleet in the airline industry that had that. We also uh, I had been challenged by the FAA that uh, a system of collision avoidance needed to be. Uh, to be established. Now, Piedmont had done a collision avoidance system back in 1970. It was a very complicated system, and in order for the system to work, every airplane they had to have a transponder, there had to be ground-based synchronized clocks to do all this stuff with the transponder and relay information, and it, it worked, but it was just too complicated and too complex for it to work. But since we had had that experience, while well, they uh, they allowed us to be the uh, project people that, uh, that really started the movement for that collision avoidance system. And Fred was appointed as the, uh, as the project manager on that. And I can tell you today, ladies and gentlemen, that that is a device that uh, with all those airplanes that were flying around up there in the sky when that, thing, when that came, on, came on board and installed in the airplanes, that's a device that's probably saved a lot of lives that we just really don't know about because it's a system that detects and helps you avoid mid-air collisions. Fred was a point man and all that, and his contributions played significantly into that development. Now, I will tell you that um, all this time, Fred and I are still in the guard. And we both got commissions, and Fred went on to maintenance school and then pilot training, as I said. But I, I was in an office, and I was flying with the airline, and the opportunity didn't come up that I could, uh, I could really go to a pilot training. But, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we were majors at the same time. We got promoted about the same time all the way through. And one morning, I was in the office there. I was an intelligence officer, and I was in the office, and, and I got this call that said, uh, 
This is Sergeant Levesey. I am Colonel Womax, NCO, and he wants to see you in his office right now. Well, I thought that was a little bit unusual. But I also thought, well, I need a reply to that. So I said, I'll tell you what, Sergeant Levesey, you just tell Colonel Womack that I'll see him in my office Monday morning at 9 o'clock and he better not be late. About two seconds passed and the phone rings and I picked it up and Fred said, Gene, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we got along real well. Uh, a lot of the things that we did at the airline, um, um, were fun in effect, but they, they, they did consume a lot of time. So one of that was hiring pilots. And Fred and I, uh, we basically, that was our responsibility through all that expansion that went on in the 80s. Um, I, I remember one really great interview we had because we'd have these people come in and they were all qualified pilots. There was no question about that because we didn't even, if, if a resume didn't meet all the qualifications, we didn't even talk to them. But we had one pilot come in, he'd been in the Air Force, and then he was in a guard. And he had applied and he came in. And we, we usually tried to uh, loosen the pilots up a little bit so they'd talk to us and tell us about some experiences and so forth. And, and we were looking at his resume and I said, well, you know about your Air Force, about your Air Force experience. And he said, well, he was flying a, a, a C-97. And I said, uh, well, tell us about that airplane. Do you, uh, how do you feel about the airplane? Did you have fun flying it and whatever? And he said, no. Nah. He said, I'm going to tell you, that's the worst airplane I have ever flown in my life. He said, the thing rattles, engines quit on it. And he said, it's, it's just really a piece of junk. And I said, well, now, you know what? That's uh, Fred's flying that in the guard over in Tennessee, and that's his favorite airplane. Well, we did that kind of see what people are doing, how would they react, and he came right back and he said, well, I want to tell you one thing, there's a lot of really nice people flying that airplane. <laughs> <clears throat> so Fred and I had a lot of fun doing that, but uh, um, I'm not going to tell you a whole lot more stories about Fred, but I, I will say Fred has done a lot of things. He was our point person in a lot of a lot of development and a lot of issues and, and all the growth that came about uh, with Piedmont. Uh, we had a fuel conservation program that now that we talk about that all the time, but we had a fuel conservation uh, program back in the uh, back in the 80s that uh, saved the company thousands and thousands of dollars in fuel bill. And also provided, uh, it didn't hurt the schedule, we still kept the airplanes on time too. So anyway, Fred's done uh, done a great job. He went on, as you can see in the brochure, that he did a lot of a lot of things outside the uh, the military and outside the airline after he retired, and did a good job of all of them. And he's been a really good representative to the uh, to the aviation community and to the airline industry. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would ask that you would help me welcome. Uh, your 2008 honoree uh, to the Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame, Major General Fred Womack. Thank you. Did I say enough? Oh, that's great. That was great. That's great. You know, this year I've had two panic attacks coming up to the podium. One was down at Tennessee Wesleyan College when I had to give about a five minute speech and I walked up and my glasses broke right in two. And there I stood. The second time is tonight when I saw Joe spill his water on my notes down here. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, Charlie, and thank you, Gene. Uh, distinguished guests, fellow inductees, ladies and gentlemen. An opportunity to be here this evening is indeed a privilege, 
And I would like to thank uh, Mr. John Ball and Mr. Charlie Nelson for their nomination. I would also like to thank my sponsors, who's the Tennessee First Squadron of the Warbirds of America, with friends Daryl Barry, John Ball, J.T. Arnold, Rip Will, and Vic Barrett, and the Board of Directors for the Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame. I'm very proud tonight to have my family sitting down here, and I have three children. And I told them, I said, if you all don't show up for this event, I'm going to drop you out of the will. They were some of the first ones to come in here tonight. So, <laughs> Teresa, my wife, and I were having dinner the other night, and I looked at her and I said, Teresa, in your wildest dream, did you ever think that I would be standing here receiving these honors tonight? She said, Fred, you're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us have heard the old cliche, if you enjoy your job, you'll never have to go to work. And I can truly say that I never had to go to work until I retired, and then there's grass to be mowed. Now that's work, and I avoid that as much as possible. Alex Haley once said, if you see a turtle perched on top of a fence post, you know it didn't get there by itself. And that's how I feel about my career. I too have had a lot of help. And that's what I would like to do in my allotted time is to recognize those who helped me along my career path. And as Gene said, I clearly remember my first flight. And Gene is my instructor. Uh, he left out a couple of things because on the first takeoff, I heard him say, you've got it. Three seconds later, he says, I've got it. And that's how it went. But what an, what an auspicious, uh, auspicious start. Uh, that same man would later uh, become my boss at Piedmont Airlines. And Gene and I have had a lot of fun. And I, I'm glad he got to talking about hiring pilots. You know, we used to get resumes because at that time we were expanding 20% per year, uh, Piedmont Airlines. And, uh, you know, about the only airline that was hiring pilots. So you can imagine how many applicants we had. So I came to work one day. And I had a, uh, uh, in my uh, conf conference table in my office, and there was a cake on that conference table, and you couldn't reach the length of that cake. And on top of that cake was a person's resume. Well, I stopped and read that resume, and good grief, was that person ever qualified? An Air Force Academy graduate, and all kinds of flying time, and, and just everything that you'd want. So I left and went up to, it was early in the morning, and then I left and went up to meet with the dispatchers to find out what was going to happen during the day with the weather and these type of things. When I came back to my office, the secretaries had got in there and cut and ate the guy's name, telephone number, and address. And to this day, we don't know who he was, you know. But, <laughs> but like so many other young men uh, that dreamed of becoming an Air Force pilot, I was that way. But my biological clock was ticking right on down because the Air Force policy of waiting one year between physical examinations had put me even closer to that magical age of 26 years old, which was a cutoff. You see, I kept busting physicals. And every time I'd bust a physical, I'd have to wait a year because I was underweight. And then being called up into Germany and spent a year over there, it looked like that my goal of becoming an Air Force pilot was not attainable. But I had a commander who had a lot of faith in me, and he, in an effort to help me, he hand-carried my records to Washington after I passed the 26 years old uh, to get an age waiver. One day, I was sitting in my home, and I got a call and said, report to Vance Air Force Base in Oklahoma to begin your undergraduate pilot training. What a great thrill that was. While I was there, my commander, and there was a, another witness in the office, the commander that recommended me, there was another witness in, in his office, received a letter instructing him to bring me home. And I guess they didn't want to set precedent about this age thing or whatever, you know. And this person told me that he opened the letter up, read it, stored it in the bottom drawer of his dress, uh, of his uh, bottom drawer uh, of his desk, and... I left it out of sight, and I went right on 
and graduated from pilot training, got my wings, and I didn't know that story until I got back. Uh, that man was a dear friend of mine and a dear friend of a lot of people, and that was Major General Robert W. Aiken, who was the former adjutant general of the state of Tennessee. And those of us who knew him still miss him to this day. He's deceased, and I'm sure he would be here tonight if he could. Maybe he is here tonight. But now, I needed a full time, I was out of pilot training, I needed a full time job. And here's where my friend Gene Sharp came back into play with me and mentored me in my airline career. He introduced me to a couple of people, Captain Roy Brown, who was the chief pilot in Knoxville, Tennessee, and Captain Jack Tadlock, who was the vice president of operations for Piedmont Airlines at that time. And I was hired. What great hands-on experience to be, begin an airline career flying a twin-engine Martin 404. And for you people who don't know what a Martin 404 is, a 44-passenger airplane with two big reciprocating engines on it, no autopilot, and all kinds of weather with as many as 13 takeoff and landings a day. But what great experience for a person starting out in the airlines. After more than a decade of flying, uh, flying the line, I transitioned into the company management, as Gene said, eventually moving from a position in the training department to the director of flight, op flight operations. I was fortunate to work for a company that gave instead of took. You know, you've got a lot of these industry in, in that business anyway that are takers. But our company was a giver, and it cost a lot of money to give things back to safety and these type of things. But Captain Jack Tadlock, who's also deceased at that time, sponsored me to join the Air Transport Association Committee to look at uh, advanced aviation technology, and Gene covered that quite well. One of the highlights of that committee was to work on an airborne collision avoidance system, as Gene mentioned. Our company was the evaluator, and I was sort of the liaison or the manager of that program. But the reason I bring it up today is that since the implementation of TCAS, that's the collision avoidance system, there have not been a mid-air collision in any aircraft equipped with that system in the United States or in the world that we know of. And I think that's significant because we were having a mid-air in the airline business about every five years before this system was put on the airplane. Another mentor, and changing gears on you a little bit, back to the guard, another mentor was Major General Paul Webb. Paul, would you stand up? Yeah. boy. <laughs> Paul's influence carried me to the state staff in Nashville, where I had the opportunity to become a general officer. Today, Paul and I count ourselves blessed to have served our country with one of the best Air National Guard units in this United States. Blessed to live today, side by side, in Teleco Village, a wonderful place to live, as evidenced by the number of friends that are celebrating with us here tonight. After my retirement from the Guard and the airlines, I wanted to continue, continue flying, so I bought a T-34 from the Mexican government. I drove down to Mexico City in an old pickup truck and a 16-foot trailer to bring this airplane home literally in pieces. Now, I didn't have but one problem on getting it across the border, and it wasn't the Mexicans' fault or the border guard. It was my fault. And I'll tell you the story. We got to Laredo, Texas, to cross the border in that old truck and the trailer. And they put us in an area where all the other trucks were parked. And a guard came out and would go on up to the drivers of the vehicles and give them a little lecture. And he came up to me and asked me where I was going, and I told him. He said, well, let me tell you something. The majority of the Mexican people are honest, family-oriented Christian people. But there's some bandits that drive the highways down through there that are very dangerous. And if you get down there driving your truck and it breaks down after dark, he said, they'll steal your trailer, they'll rape your wife. And why I said what I said at the time, I don't know. I guess it was nerves. But I looked that guy right in the eye and I said, steal my trailer. And so, It was a quiet trip on down to Mexico. <laughs> you see, my wife is fluent in Spanish. 
and she was helping me. I couldn't have made the trip without her. She was fluent in Spanish. And I noticed she did speak to me in the trip, but it was always in Spanish. And I don't understand Spanish, so. Hey, it was a new trailer. Okay. <laughs> However, without the help of John Ball and Roland Coles, who's sitting right over here, I would never finish the restoration of that airplane. And thanks to John and Roland. And Roland Coles was the maintenance man of the year at a conference in Nashville last year. And he's a great mechanic. John, would you stand up? Atta boy, John. John sponsored me as a board member of the Experimental Aircraft Association, Warbirds of America. And I've been active in that organization for many years. And I treasure the friendships I've made with these groups. Friends like my sponsors, my flying buddies are out here in the audience tonight, who are always available to fly missing man formation for parades or veterans funerals or patriotic ceremonies. Friends such as those who are here in the, this museum tonight, like the quiet Birdman at our tables there, the representative of Tennessee Wesleyan College, Dr. Condon, and some of the trustees are here. Piedmont Airlines represents several of those out in the audiences. Tennessee Air National Guard. So ladies and gentlemen, you can see and imagine, after my remarks, what I cherish, cherish most about my careers, and that is the people that I've had the privilege of knowing along the way. My time is up, and I thank you for yours. A real big hand for all of our inductees. To close tonight, I'll recite this verse. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace where never lark or ever eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind, I've trod the high and trespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. That is high flight. Hope you have a, had a good evening. Hope you can be back next year on November the 14th, 2009. Don't forget the silent auction. Thank you very much and good night.